and spoil the surprise. Um, so come to that. That's going to be after service next Sunday. Also, YAMS, which is Young Adult Methodists. Um, there's a group that meets between services from 9.45 to about 10.30, so they're just now getting out. They met today, but they're going to meet every Sunday from here on out. Um, next Sunday, they're going to meet right in the chapel in this back room over here with the pointy door. The YAMS group will meet there next Sunday, um, and otherwise they'll meet upstairs in the Brian Dykus. So if you're a young adult um, and you want to have a Bible study in a social hour, that's where they'll be. It's really cool. I just went there. So there's also more information in your first things. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, check out our website, findhopedowntown.org, and check out media for more information as well. Would you please center your hearts and your spirit as we listen to the prelude? Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? We thank you, God, for the gift of this day. We thank you, God, for the ability to come together to worship. We thank you, God, for the blessings in our lives and in our world.
you please join me as we pray together? We believe in God, maker of all things, provider of all things, who loves all people. We follow Jesus, in whom salvation has come to us. He sees us for who we are, heals the wounds of our heart, and makes us new. In his death and resurrection, we see the deepest truth of life. We live by the power of the Holy Spirit, which equips us for self-giving love. We give thanks for the church, the body of the church, and for the gift of forgiveness, the promise of resurrection, and the mystery of eternal life. Amen. I know it's cold and flu season, lots of stuff going around, and you'll notice I never uh, tell you to shake hands. That's your choice. If you don't feel comfortable shaking hands, you can just say good morning to those around you. You can do the fist bump, the elbow bump. You can bump a rump if you want to. <laughs> but at least take a moment to greet everyone around you warmly to worship today.
You will note that there is a rose here on the baptismal font that celebrates the birth of Bridget Ann Klein uh, to Brian and Jane Klein. And she's got a great birthday, 02022020, uh, February 2nd. Uh, and then uh, grandparents are Chris and Diane. Uh, Chris just asked for prayer for Eddie because now he has three sisters he's growing up with. So uh, we rejoice in the gift of this new life and look forward to meeting uh, Bridget very soon. Uh, also happy to report a, a great turnout for our young adult group that's going to start meeting on Sundays between uh, worship services. And uh, you're encouraged if you're a young adult. They've, the, they've made the definition very broad. So uh, if you feel young, <laughs> you can show up for the young adult's uh, in Brian Dykus Hall, but next week because of the dessert auction, I'm, I'm told they're going to be in Warren Chapel. So uh, we got a great start to that, and I'm, I'm so glad. We do want to offer our sympathy to Julie Hoffman and her family. Uh, her brother, uh, Jim Heller, uh, passed away unexpectedly this past week, and I've been told there'll be a visitation at 9 and funeral at 10 on Monday uh, down in Murfreesboro at the Crawshaw Funeral Home. So let's remember the Hoffman family in our prayers. Let's now uh, take a moment to uh, spend some time in God as we offer our prayers to him. Our good loving God, we, we rejoice in the gift of this day that you've given to us. We thank you for having sustained us and helped us in ways great and small throughout the past week. We thank you for blessings that you've given us, for joys that have brightened our day, for reminders of your love through the caring of, of other people, for strength in the face of adversity, for food, for shelter, friendship, and family. And we thank you, God, for the privilege of gathering in this place to offer you our praise and our worship. We ask, God, that you'd help us to know your spirit and to feel the touch of your hand upon us during this time together. And we pray that we'll leave here with a renewed commitment and renewed passion to share the good news of Jesus with everyone. With these prayers, God, we, we lift before you our petitions, our pleas for others we know who have needs today. Uh, we lift before you those whose bodies need healing. We pray for those whose hearts and spirits and emotions need wholeness. Uh, we pray, God, for relationships and families that are needing some repair. And God, we pray for all the needs of this broken world in which we live, uh, for those who still live in places of poverty and war and, and disease, for, for children who need your care and protection, uh, for nations and for peoples that need to learn your ways of peace and justice. And with these prayers, we also offer you our own individual needs as well. And we, we do so remembering that you are bigger than our biggest problem. You're a God who never leaves us and never forsakes us. You're the one who's promised that your grace will always be sufficient for our every need. You truly are an awesome God. And as we worship you today, we give you our whole selves as an offering of praise and thanksgiving. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as we're so bold now to pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our prayer chorus is one we haven't sung in a while, but I love it. It's from the Teze community in France called Live in Charity. Uh, Kathy's going to play it through once, and then we'll sing it uh, the second time around.
As we prepare to share our gifts and ourselves, let's meditate on this word from song. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust. Would the ushers please come forward? As we dedicate our gifts, let us pray together. We thank you, God, that you have blessed us to be a blessing. May these offerings reveal your love and honor your name as we serve your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing, Take Time to Be Holy.
You may be seated, and let's invite the children to come up for children's time with Gina this morning. Come on down. Don't be bashful. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Do any of you know what this coming Friday is? That is exactly right. It is Valentine's Day. Now, I'm, I'm pretty old. You guys know that. When I was a little girl, they had great big bags of these you could buy, and they were called conversation hearts. Now they call them sweetheart candies. But they had little words on them. And it was a really big deal when I was probably about Lily's age, if the right little boy gave me the right heart, oh, what's wrong? Do you want to go sit with Dad? Yeah, you want to go back to Daddy? Okay, it's okay. It's okay, sweetie. <laughs> this is the wrong heart. <laughs> uh -huh. But it was a really big deal that the right little boy gave me just a right heart. I wanted it to say, love you, crazy for you, I like you, something. But it never really quite happened. But it got me to thinking, when I saw these hearts, wouldn't it be neat if God or Jesus could send us these hearts? Like maybe if we got a heart like this from Jesus that said, crazy for you? Wouldn't that be neat if God could send us a heart that said crazy for you? That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Or if he said, be mine. But he kind of does, doesn't he? He does. He says that to us all the time. And he tells us that we rock. And he tells us that he loves us. Those are all kinds of things that he's telling us. And he wants to have conversation with us. How could we have conversation with God? Does anybody know? Pray. Yeah. We pray. Sometimes, how can he have a conversation with us? We need to be still and listen, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to go downstairs and talk some more about this. So let's pray and let's go downstairs, okay? Dear God, Help us to always remember to be still and listen for you and listen for you to talk and speak to us. Amen. All right, let's go. I suggested to Ian that if, if God's passing out the hearts, you know, some of them would say tithe, you know, he said maybe get to church on time, stuff like that, so. I know uh, they've taken out the blue slips, but uh, for at least a couple more weeks, if this works, uh, Ian and I were looking just for some questions about faith, scripture, whatever, uh, to base a sermon series upon, and we've gotten a couple of really good questions, but if there's something that's kind of nagging at you and you'd like maybe for us to explore it together, uh, fill that out. You might want to grab a slip after church if you haven't done so and, and give it to us. And we'll try to see if there are some things uh, we can make into a sermon series on uh, questions uh, that you have. Now, I will uh, admit that one of my deficiencies as a preacher is I don't preach from the Old Testament uh, quite often as I should, uh, quite as often as I should. Uh, and a lot of people I know are kind of scared of the Old Testament. Uh, because it's just kind of a different world, and, and some people may even think it's not relevant given the New Testament, which really isn't accurate, uh, because the Old Testament's full of stories of a God of grace who's pursuing us in love. Uh, so I'm preaching from the Old Testament today, and I felt perhaps uh, it might be helpful to do a little uh, background before we actually read this, uh, the Scripture lesson. So as a book, Micah is uh, one of the uh, 12 minor prophets. Minor, needs, minor means shorter. Uh, there are 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. I think there are five major prophets, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Uh, so there are 12 minor prophets. Micah's number six in the list. And this uh, comes from the latter half 
of the 8th century BC, okay? Now, a prophet. We think of prophets as foretelling the future, but in the Bible, a prophet is really just a truth teller, somebody who speaks the truth on behalf of God. And somebody, I forget who it was, uh, said that, that really a prophet, a prophet's purpose is to criticize and to energize. They often use quite vivid and graphic language and images to kind of wake people up to what God wants them to hear, but then they also uh, energize them and motivate them to change their ways. Uh, so that's what it means to be a prophet. Now, as far as, oh, this is a good quote from Eugene Peterson. He says, prophets train us to respond to God's presence and voice. Pro we need prophets in our world. They train us to respond to God's presence and God's voice. Now, as far as Micah the person, the name Micah means who is like the Lord, who is like Yahweh. And he was preaching in the southern kingdom of Judah. This was a time when you had the northern tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom, and you had the southern kingdom of Judah. And he was from a small village and went to Jerusalem to preach to the urban elite. So he's kind of a country boy preacher, uh, preaching to those in power. Now, the context. Uh, morals were low in society, government officials were corrupt, and religion was largely self-serving. And this is 2,500 years ago. Um, the poor suffered while the rich got richer. And one commentary says it was a time fraught with injustice, oppression, and corruption. And, and I've lost the track of where I copy this from, but this is a commentary probably 20, 30 years old. It says, Judah experienced religious reforms, and an economic revolution that left the wealthy landowners growing in prosperity at the expense of small peasant farmers. Religious and political leaders began to view their vocations and positions as business careers with opportunities to assert their power for purposes of self-interest instead of for the common good. The times then became fraught with injustice, oppression, and corruption. Now, as far as uh, kind of the literary structure of this, uh, Micah in this passage is imagining a lawsuit, kind of like a courtroom, and God has a complaint against his people. Uh, imagine, if you would, as we read this, that God is the prosecuting attorney and representing the defendant are the people of God, and the jury are the mountains and the hills, the whole earth that have been there since the beginning of time. Okay, so that kind of sets up uh, what, uh, what this passage is saying. So let's go to the scripture itself, and this is the introduction uh, to this short section. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. Now let's imagine God, the prosecuting attorney, is speaking. God says, O oh my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh my people, Remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Baor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. Well, the response of the defendant, God's people, is this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with 10,000 uh, of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then the prophet speaks. And he says, he's told you, mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in sight of God, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Here is a wire hanger that comes with a warning label. It says, Caution, 
do not swallow. <laughs> some prescription labels from some medication. Uh, take one tablet by mouth into right eye. Or this one's really good. Every night before uh, food, once daily, to be taken four times a day, three times a day, uh, every three times daily, take one, take two, take three, take one or two, and then the warning says be sure and follow the written instructions. <laughs> Here's a clothing label. You know, for best results, you want a machine wash cold, you want to tumble dry low and never iron the design. For worst results, drag through a puddle behind the car and blow dry on your uh, roof rack. <laughs> These instructions go along with a hair dryer. Do not use on people who are sleeping. <laughs> and there's probably a reason they added that to the instructions, you know. Uh, some chopsticks came with these instructions, said, good luck. <laughs> Uh, there was this image on a hair straightener, a, a, a flattening iron. Uh, apparently, you shouldn't use it to uh, straighten your eyebrows, okay? And then a couple more clothing tags. Uh, this one says, uh, wash, what does it say? Wash this one dirty. And then the other one, after telling you how to use the washer and dryer, says, can be washed by both men and women, hashtag share the load. So. So let me ask you this, if life came with a set of instructions, what do you think they would be? If your life had an operating manual, a set of operating instructions on how to live life successfully and productively, what do you think it would say? Well, I kind of think that the prophet Micah gives us a very good suggestion. I've already told you a lot about the context in which Micah speaks his prophecy. The rich grew richer while the poor grew poor. There was an influx of refugees that they didn't know what to do with after the fall of Samaria. They were overspending on military power while also trying to appease their enemies through financial payments. But more than anything, Micah spoke of God's concern for the poor and the dispossessed, those who've been tossed aside as the nation focused more and more of its energy and its resources on its security and its economic success. He tells the people plainly that they're on the path to self-destruction. He says that you are on the road to nowhere. And it isn't just some idle complaint. Micah declares that God doesn't like this. God isn't happy that the people have become self-centered and self-absorbed. God isn't happy that national leaders seem to have forgotten the values that they have been taught by God, such as caring for the poor and the vulnerable in society. God isn't happy that their religious practices are empty and vacuous and self-serving. God's complaint is expressed very clearly through Micah. God says... Oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me. Why are you treating me this way? Why are you acting this way when I've told you better? God's saying, I'm sick and tired of it. And then Micah imagines the people trying to figure out what they might do to please God, how to make up for their transgressions. You know, maybe if we just made the right kind of offering to God, you know, that's the ticket. What if we tried to buy off God with thousands of rams and rivers of oil? Would it make God happy if I offered my own firstborn child to Him? Would that be enough to make up for our sins? Well, of course, it's nonsense because you can't buy off God. No offering will substitute for a change in their behavior. Micah then goes from criticizing to energizing, as prophets would often do. And he declares that the remedy, the antidote, is obvious. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does God require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? My friends, I dare say that these are the basic operating instructions for life as God intends it. If you want to know how to use your life productively and successfully, if you want to live a life that is meaningful, if you really do want to please God in the way you lead your life, this is what God asks. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Now, what does it all mean? 
First, justice is a somewhat loaded word. You know, we may think of justice as calling the law and, and hauling in wrongdoers and putting them in jail, but that's not what the biblical concept of justice is about. Most simply, this means to do the right thing. In the Bible, justice is concerned about with bringing about what God desires in creation and in human relationships. It means taking care of the most vulnerable members of society, the widow, the orphan, the poor, the oppressed, recognizing the sacred value of each and every human being. And justice is always concerned with the common good, not just what's in it for me, but what is best for all persons. Justice also requires action. It's something you have to do. It's to take action and not just talk about it. And it is this kind of justice that Micah says is missing in their society. It's this kind of justice that God desires among his people. One night this past week, we were sitting at the dinner table, and, and my wife Jennifer began tearing up, actually, as she told of a meeting she had with some community leaders very recently. Uh, she is a nurse in the Head Start program here in our community. And she was describing how the working poor in our community, the parents of many kids that she deals with each and every day, and these are parents who are working sometimes one job, two jobs, three jobs, they lack dental insurance of any kind, and they're additionally hindered by the absence of nearby providers who might accept a medical card whenever that might be available. And this goes to Jennifer's heart because it is the children who suffer. You see... That's, that's about justice. That's caring about the common good and seeking change that will benefit those who are most vulnerable. So what does God ask of us? First, to do justice, to do the right thing, and seek the common good. Second, Micah tells us, love kindness. The Hebrew word here is hesed, which is often translated as steadfast love in the Bible. Uh, Maxie Dunham describes this kind of kindness as the desire to bless someone with good. Kindness is the desire to bless someone with good. Again, in the Bible, this refers to the demonstration of love, loyalty, and faithfulness in all of our human relationships. To love kindness is to live ethically with other human beings. And you know, the King James Version uses the word mercy rather than kindness. It's about loving mercy. Just yesterday, this wasn't in my original sermon, but I came across a, a short article that, that told of these two New York policemen who on July 4th uh, were very hot and they stepped into a Whole Foods market to get a cold drink. And, and as they walked in the store, the, the store security guard came over and said, would you help me with something? And they said, sure. And they, they took them over to a, a, a shoplifter a woman who was standing there crying her eyes out, and they opened her bag, and she had food in this bag. And she said, I'm hungry. And one of the officers, without consulting the others, said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay for your food. And they each chipped in $10. And rather than being led away in handcuffs, she was sent out the door with food to eat. You see, that's loving mercy. That's loving kindness. You know, Pope Francis is all about mercy and our deep need for, for mercy and kindness within our human uh, relationships. In his book, The Name of God is Mercy, he says, the fragility of our era is this. We don't believe that there is a chance for redemption, for a hand to raise you up, for an embrace to save you, forgive you, pick you up, flood you with infinite, patient, indulgent love to put you back on your feet. He says we need Mercy. Yes, we need mercy, Micah tells us, and we need to extend this kindness, this merciful kindness into all of our relationships. Our third instruction from Micah is to walk humbly with your God. According to my handy-dandy Jewish study Bible, I'm sure all of you have it in your library, the original meaning of these words could be to walk wisely with your God. And yet another commentary puts it this way, saying that to walk humbly with God implies attentiveness or paying attention to God. You see, it's about, it's about following God's lead and learning what is important to God. You see, our relationship with God 
is properly characterized by humility, not by pride, not by self-centeredness, not by self-righteousness, but by walking humbly and wisely with our God. You know, if I myself ever felt the urge to be prophetic, it is when Christian folk presuming to speak for God declare that God is on our side in the culture wars, uh, that God hates whomever it is that we happen to hate, that God sanctifies whatever status quo it may be that makes me feel safe and secure. You see, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. And we would all do well to follow the wisdom of Micah 6.8 by walking humbly and wisely with God, following God's lead. Several months back, I came across a story that caught my attention, and I think it's just a very small portrayal, a small image of what it might look like to live by the words of Micah 6.8, doing the right thing, embracing kind, merciful love, and humbly following after God. It's a two-minute video, and uh, this is reported by a television station in New York City. So let's dim the lights and uh, turn up the sound and give our attention to the screens. Got a story now that got our attention for our Be Kind campaign. A jogger in Manhattan gave his shoes and his socks to a homeless man who was sitting on a sidewalk. The video was posted on Twitter and went viral. Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Richardson spoke exclusively with the man who received the footwear. He told me they're a size 13. He asked me my size. It was like finding a needle in a haystack in a city of millions tracking down Joe. We didn't know his name, only knew that was him there, sitting on the sidewalk Sunday morning in Lower Manhattan, when something spectacular happened in this video that's gone viral. Joe is only talking to Eyewitness News. I never thought somebody would just come out and take their shoes off and just give them to me. That's exactly what happened. Joe, who's homeless, tells me the jogger, a stranger, noticed he had holes in the bottom of his sneakers, then said... I've been blessed pretty much my whole life. God has been very nice to me, you know. Um, well, I feel like I should bless you too. Here, take my shoes. And he took them off and he gave them to me. And... What did you think? I was surprised. The man walked off barefoot. It was here on Church Street. The woman who shot this video happened to be stopped at a red light and started recording. At first, Joe tells me he thought it was all a setup. He sent somebody across the street to record him doing it so that he looks like the hero of the town, but no, and I, you know, I really see that it was something from the heart. Joe's lived on the streets for years, admits he's had his fair share of trouble and struggles, but tells me he's ready to get his life back on track. If you give me the chance, I'll be the most amazing worker you could have. <laughs> And I do overtime. As for the jogger, the man who took a few minutes to help someone else, Joe is grateful. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I can say. I don't know what to say. I wanted to, like, hug the guy or something, but then a homeless man hugging somebody is not normal out here, so. <laughs> so what does God ask of us? What are the operating instructions that might make our lives purposeful, and pleasing to God. Quite simply, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God, or jog humbly with God. That is, do the right thing, let self-giving love saturate all your human relationships, and walk humbly and wisely with God wherever He leads us. I like how Eugene Peterson paraphrases the words of Micah 6, 8. He's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Amen? Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the precious gift of this life that you've given us. We ask you to help us take you more seriously by doing the right thing, by loving kindness and showing mercy to others, and most certainly by walking humbly with you each and every new day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. As you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing together.
do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. This service is ended, but our life in God goes on and on. May your faith be so real, your joy so obvious that all who see you will come to praise God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Thank you.